everybody to our second last exam cram session. This is a two parter. So first part is on tonight. Second part is on Thursday night. And we've got Nicola and Andy talking to us about the DP 500, the big Mac daddy of certifications out there at the moment. So it's a very popular topic and you're all welcome here. Um, without any further ado, I'm just going to pass over to you guys. Andy, do you want to just kick off there and uh, I'll keep an eye on the chat and uh, thanks for doing the session. We really appreciate it and uh, it's great to get the support for it. So looking forward to it. Thanks, guys. Great stuff. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Justin. So, I mean, firstly, Nicola and I usually do this session in, you know, a regular 50 minute slot. There's a lot of slides because you know, the exam covers quite a lot of content. So usually we <clears throat> we kind of rattle through those slides and it's quite a lot to just bang, be hit with in 50 minutes. So this is just an opportunity, you know, over you know tonight and Thursday to just take things a little slower. I'd like to go through a couple of extra things in the preamble in terms of coming to the DP 500 or any Microsoft certification. And then we've got some demos as well. Demos cannot fit in just a normal session. So it's good to just have a look and go through those as well. Nicola has got pretty much all of the Power BI content and I'll be covering the Synapse and Purview content and some source control in Synapse as well. So <clears throat> I think because Nicola will be talking for you know half an hour, 35 minutes, I'll be doing the same. We'll probably both be monitoring the chat, make it a bit interactive. We probably won't stop for questions and go through. So we'll leave some Q&A to the end, but any questions you pop in, either me or Nicola can answer, you know, as we go along, especially links, links to resources. Um, either me or Nicola might have a training course. It's not me, it's Nicola available. So I'm sure Nicola can drop something in the chat as that uh, for that as well, if you like structured content around learning for a uh, certification. Anyway, so let's kick off. So this is session one of two. So we've got one tonight, which will cover some aspects of Power BI and Synapse. We've got another one Thursday that will finish off the Power BI content. I think there's going to be some licensing uh, information there. We'll look at some charting options uh, in Synapse. And we'll look at purview as well. So that will all come on Thursday. Here, we'll look at uh, we'll look at the other side of Power BI. I think using you know large data set formats, <clears throat> things like that, and the SQL pools within within Synapse. So, Nicola, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Andy. First of all, it's my pleasure always delivering this session with you, and I uh, every time I enjoy it. And uh, uh, as you said, we have three hours now, which allows us to yeah uh, do things a little bit slower, answer more questions, do some demos because it's usually 50, 60 minutes and we don't have time to, to show anything uh, uh, in demo. So we basically just cover the slides and talk about the most important thing. So uh, yeah, at the very beginning, uh, uh, my name is Nikolilic. I'm originally from Belgrade in Serbia. But uh, for last almost seven years, I live in a beautiful city of Salzburg in Austria, uh, where I work as an independent data platform consultant and trainer. Uh, living in Salzburg was the reason why I've chosen this nickname, Data Mozart. Uh, you probably know that Salzburg is famous as a birthplace of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Uh, so I was brave enough to use his last name as part of my nickname. And that's why I'm trying to make some music from the data. Uh, you can find me on, on web. I'm regularly blogging at data mozartcom I'm active on social media, LinkedIn, Twitter, so uh, feel free to connect if you like. Uh, privately, I'm father of two kids and a big football or soccer if you're coming from USA and Barca fan, as you may conclude, looking at this photo on the screen. <laughs> Andy, handing back over to you. 
Thanks, Nicola. Yeah, I do. I, I, I have to admit, I really do enjoy doing this session as well. So the more of it, the better. So, yeah, my name is Andy Cutler. Um, I work as an independent uh, data platform consultant, mostly in the Azure space. So working with Synapse and Power BI, not on the visualization and DAX side, you know, think of the, the data modeling side, really pretty much what the TP500 covers. I mostly blog at serverlesssql.com. Data High is, is my business website and the QR codes, well, both QR codes just take you to our Twitter accounts. And yeah, always, always love a good conversation on Twitter about uh, data and analytics. <clears throat> so, okay, I'm going to say it's still new because it's less than a year old. It was released into beta April, and Nicola can jump in and correct me uh, if I'm wrong on any dates. It got released into beta, and it was in beta for two to three months. And I think everyone who took the beta certification got their results sometime around the end of May, June, something like that. And then I think it became generally available you know, later on in the year, once they'd had feedback and, you know, they'd uh, amended and got the content shaped, you know, how they wanted it to be shaped. So I'm just going to pause on there for a second. Um, and this is Microsoft's really great attempt to put the data engineering and the data analyst areas together. And of course, one of the role terms that has appeared recently is the whole analytics engineering. If you see any diagrams that describe that role, actually advancing analytics, if you look on their blog, they've gone through the whole analytics engineering thing. And if you look at the skills and the platforms that the DP500 is covering, and you look at the definition of an analytics engineer, they're pretty similar. I'm not saying they're exact, but hey, all I'm saying is it could easily be called the Azure Enterprise Analytics Engineer Associate. Yeah, so yes, it's got data analyst in there, but don't just think it's about, you know, about the data analyst, the PL300, because you've got to deal with Synapse. You've got to deal with some data governance in there in terms of purview as well. But really, really interesting space as well. And probably one of the first certifications I actually got excited about. So just a couple of changes to be aware of. Um, there's always a bit of a panic when they release exam changes. Anyone who's done anything to do with Azure Data Engineering, the, the DP203, that single exam, it used to be two exams. They themselves were two new versions from two older exams. Yeah, I really like the fact there's only a couple of changes here. So <clears throat> we've got just some naming conventions, really. So they're using the term um, Microsoft Purview now instead of Azure purview, and then in the implement and manage data models, they're calling out the use of query folding specifically. And actually, I think Nicola has got a great blog about query folding. So <clears throat> it's really some semantics. That's all it is. There's no fundamental changes from that initial printed uh, skills measured document that they released versus the changes now. So in terms of who should be taking this exam, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this. So what I'm going to do is just bring all three up and say, look, you're going to be responsible for cleaning and transforming data. This whole concept of building enterprise data models, large scale data models, complex data models, incorporating advanced analytics a little bit in terms of using the predict function for machine learning and maybe some of the um, Python charts for plotting data. But actually, don't panic too much. There's no huge 
uh, requirement to learn things like machine learning. It's just a small little bit. Um, and then apply, uh, applying development life cycles. So source controlling options in Synapse and CICD pipelines in Power BI. But then where they, these professionals help, <clears throat> the word enterprise appears again. So enterprise level requirements. Yes, look, if you are using a product like Synapse, and you're using a service like dedicated, it's probably going to be under the umbrella of enterprise. Yeah, you're not going to use a service like dedicated for a, a very small data set. Data governance, so the use of purview to catalog assets and be able to browse those assets as well. On the candidates should have, and by bearing in mind that this candidate profile that I've taken is from the official certification itself. I've just broken it up into into uh, different areas and bullet points. So when it says candidates should have DAX, not much, not much. Again, I think Nicola can correct me if I'm wrong. PL300, the Power BI data analyst, is going to contain more DAX than this. I think I. I I question whether I actually had a DAX question. I don't think I did when I when I did the certification. If I did, it was one. Um, T SQL, yeah. So you know the ability to use T SQL with Synapse Analytics and visualizing data. So we're looking at the couple of options in Synapse for visualizing data. Strangely enough, it's nothing to do with visualizing data in Power BI. It's within Synapse itself. Uh, so in terms of the skills measured, again, I just want to go through these pretty quickly. Uh, you've got four distinct areas. And they're all roughly 25% each. Yeah, so they're nicely evenly split in terms of what you're looking at. And they kind of flow um, in a, a meaningful manner. So you've got the implementing and managing the actual environment itself. So that's Power BI, that's Synapse, then querying and transforming data, right? So that's getting data from Synapse into Power BI and transforming it. Then it's all about implementing, managing your Power BI data models themselves, and then exploring and visualizing data, which funnily enough doesn't include actually visualizing it within Power BI, but you can see it all follows a logical flow. And this is with any of the certifications, when you look at the skills measured and you look at the categories of the skills, you can usually build up a picture or a flow of what it's doing. It's rare that a certification is published with a skills breakdown that just goes off on weird tangents. Usually they all follow some sort of pattern. So, for example, again, I keep going back to the D, the DP two uh, the DP um, two hundred three the analytic uh, the Azure um, data engineer. But each of those skills measured kind of flows into the next one. You know, designing data lake storage, designing large scale relational models, designing ETL processes. Yeah, they all kind of fit together. So, try and think of a flow in your head about all of this. Um, so the data platform services, yes, we've got Power BI front and center. We've got Synapse, we've got Data Lake, we've got Azure DevOps, Purview for the data governance side of things, and then external tools. So DAX Studio, Tabular Editor, and Vertipack Analyzer. So as you can see, there's quite a lot in there. It's a light touch with a lot of these services, all right? So Purview, it only covers a couple of the areas within Purview. Synapse, it only really covers the two SQL pools. You're not expected to know anything about pipelines or Spark or Data Explorer, anything like that. Yeah, it's keeping it, keeping it nice and simple with those two services. <clears throat> um, and then in terms of where the enterprise data analyst sits, can be somebody that coordinates with all of these roles. So a solution architect sitting there at a very high level may not be in the detail when it comes to Synapse. Yeah, they might drag and drop the Synapse icon 
into their Visio diagram and start connecting up boxes and arrows to it, but they might not necessarily be at the low level in which service is going to be used, which modes in Power BI are going to be used to get that data, that enterprise data analyst can help. Uh, data engineers, what is the best way for a data engineer to get the data into the format that is going to help downstream into Power BI? Yep, so you can see that role can actually get quite busy when it talks to a lot of other roles as well. So in terms of the session content breakdown, actually, this is wrong. We're going to be looking at Power BI and Synapse today. Thursday, we'll carry on with Power BI, we'll finish off Synapse, and we'll look at purview and external tools. Um, so Power BI and Synapse today, then Power BI and Synapse, the rest of it, purview and external tools. <clears throat> so before I hand over to Nicola, just want to show you one thing. On the page itself, and I might as well just drop that straight into the chat. You have the exam page. I know it's a really obvious thing to say. But read it. Read it, have a look through, download the study guide. Study guides got it all in there. Everything that you need. To know to pass that exam. Plus, you've got the exam sandbox. Now, it's not specific to DP500. It's more about understanding how a Microsoft exam is put together. So if we go in, just click next, ready to start the exam, because I've taken loads of certifications over the years, and even now, when I sit down to do a certification and I see that checkbox that says, are you ready to start the exam? The tension and the nervousness and the and the slight panic that I start to feel even before I even before I click, even if I'm working from home and I'm doing it in a nice, calming, comfortable environment, even then sometimes I can oh, all of a sudden get a bit nervous. So this sandbox exam is actually pretty good because it gets you used to what you're going to need to do if you do it several times over and over again by the time you sit down to do the exam you'll be like yeah i've seen this screen before let's get cracking and nail this exam um so it's going to just show you how certifications or how questions are put together one of the things about these certifications is that usually, I mean, they follow a pretty standard pattern. And sometimes what you can do is you don't necessarily have to know the answer. What you can do is by process of elimination, get to the right answer. I've done that plenty of times where I've not known the answer, but actually it really only makes sense if I select two or three of those answers because I've by process of elimination, I've just thrown out the answers that are red herrings, thrown out the things that are not great. I tell you what, the, the sets of questions that always get me are the put the steps in order where you have to drop and drag and put the steps in order. But by and large, Run through a sandbox if you're a bit, you know, if you haven't really used, um, if you've not done many certifications before, run through the sandbox, get used to how it's presenting the questions. Then when you sit the exam, you should be OK. And I think with that, oh, and the last thing I'll do before switching over to, to Nicola is, uh, again, it's about the certification itself. I think there are two valid reasons to sit a certification. One is to, and this is the one that Microsoft always say, which is validating your knowledge. If you've been working in this area for a while, or you just need to plug a few gaps, you can sit the certification and pass it and say, hey, look, I know what I'm talking about. But I tell you what, it's also equally valid, and don't let anyone else tell you this, 
if you're new to this, if you're new to Power BI, if you're new to Synapse, it's entirely valid to use the exam to learn about these services as well. Yeah, so, you know, I, I don't want to hear anyone gatekeeping about sitting these exams after you've gained experience. You can learn, you can gain experience whilst doing these certifications as well. So, and of course, you can always learn the content and you don't have to sit the exam if you don't want to. So there we go. Right, I'm going to hand over to Nicola now. Thanks, Andy. Let me start sharing my screen. And there we go with Power BI. We are starting with Power BI. Uh, thanks, Andy, for this great introduction, and I'm sure it was super, super helpful for the audience, especially uh, you were spot on with this sandbox thing. Uh, I know it's very helpful. Uh, not just that you will learn something. Uh, you saw that the questions are uh, some dummy questions with dummy answers, but it will uh, enable you to feel more comfortable when you take the real exam. So you will be familiar with the environment, with types of questions, uh, for me, fonts, uh, sizes and everything else. So you, you will become familiar and you should feel more comfortable once you once you decide to take the real exam. Now, because we are talking about the real exam, uh, let's jump into the real things that we are going to cover tonight and on Thursday. So we are kicking it off with Power BI topics, and there are at least, I would say, four subtopics within Power BI uh, that are being covered by, by this exam. And those four top subtopics are data model creation and management. So we are uh, talking about tabular data model, working with tabular data model performance and optimization within this tabular model, uh, then administration and governance, to governance topics that we are going to cover on Thursday, and also data visualization topics. Some of them we will also cover uh, on uh, on Thursday evening. So let's get straight into the action. And uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is composite models. Now, if you're talking with Power BI professionals, you may hear them talking about two different composite models features. Uh, don't be afraid and don't be surprised uh, if you hear uh, terms like uh, uh, composite model Gen 2 or composite model uh, V2 or stuff like that. So uh, now we are talking about the version 1, uh, the traditional version of composite models. It's basically the feature that lets you combine data coming from two different direct query sources like, for example, SQL Server database and Oracle database. Then also data coming from uh, direct query and import mode. So, for example, uh, you will use a few tables in uh, from SQL Server in direct query mode, few tables uh, from SQL Server or from uh, Excel file or from Oracle database in import mode. So any combination of those of these uh, uh, cases that I mentioned, so two different direct query sources or direct query source plus import mode. This is composite model and this feature will be the main focus of uh, our today's session. Because I already mentioned this version two, uh, I need to provide at least like two sentence long explanation. What is this? This is not an official name uh, for this feature. Uh, the official name, at least at this moment, is direct query for Power BI data sets and Azure analysis services. This will probably be changed once this uh, feature becomes generally available because it's still in public preview. And essentially, uh, this feature enables you to connect to a published Power BI data set and use it in combination with other direct query and or import mode data. So that's super powerful, opens all, uh, a whole range of possibilities, but this is still in public preview, so we will not cover it today, and this is not part of the exam itself, but it's good to know that this exists. So what are the composite models? In the dark ages of Power BI, now when you look at this product, I know it's hard to imagine that Power BI had dark ages, but yes, believe me, a few years ago it had. So once you've chosen direct query for a certain data source, like SQL Server, for example, uh, the possibility to extend on this was completely gone. So to put it simple, you couldn't combine a direct query query over one data source 
which is SQL Server, for example, with a direct query query over another data source, like I already mentioned Oracle, but you can think of any other uh, relational database or any other data source that supports direct query mode. Uh, luckily, these times are behind us, and now you can create a data model in Power BI like you see in this illustration. For example, uh, we have data coming from Excel file, which is stored on uh, your local machine. Then we have a data, also imported data from one SQL Server table. Then we have another uh, source group, which is basically direct query query that retrieves data from another SQL Server table. And we also have a direct query query uh, that retrieves the data from Oracle database table. So the mix of everything, as you may see. However, pay attention on those lines here. This one, this one, and this one. So each of those rectangle, rectangles uh, represent one source group. So all imported data, everything that you import in Power BI, Nevertheless, if it's Excel file and SQL Server table, all of that is being uh, treated as one source group. So imported data is one source group. And then we have for each direct query uh, data source, we have additional source groups. So we have in this case, we have three different source groups. Now you're probably wondering why some of these dash, some of these arrows are dashed, some of them are not. Uh, and that's that's a good question, I would say. Uh, so whenever you have a relationship, because you can establish relationship between different source groups, uh, whenever you have a relationship between different source group, uh, you will have a limited, so-called limited relationship or weak relationship. That was the previous official name. Uh, and so we are talking about this one this one and this one so relationships between different source groups whenever you have relationship within one source group we are talking about regular or strong relationships so this one this one and this one okay so there is not inherent there is nothing inherently wrong with uh, limited relationships but they come with many limitations and considerations of course we can talk about that in next 10, 15 minutes at least. So I would suggest, and I will drop uh, a link into the chat window. Uh, SQL BI guys, Italians, uh, Marco and Alberto, they have a great article on this topic, uh, understanding all the possible uh, limitations when using limited relationships. Just keep in mind two things when you are working with composite models in Power BI. You can create relationship between the data coming from different storage mode sources, but you also must be aware of the behavior of these relationships. Those are two takeaways from this part uh, when we, we are talking about composite models. Now, as Andy mentioned, there is a nice flow when you are uh, 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 navigating through different topics within this exam. So the logical, uh, the logical sequence in this case would be to continue talking about, uh, of course, uh, composite models, best practices, and then I will switch to aggregations that are, uh, uh, this is the feature that uh, in most cases come together in synergy with composite models. So when do we need to use composite models or when should we use composite models? Obviously import mode is the one that is uh, uh, that, that something that works best in Power BI. Uh, because your data is being kept in cache memory, it's the fastest, uh, so it provides the best possible performance. Uh, all DAX functions are available, so this is something uh, that you should strive to achieve whenever possible. So only when the pure import, import mode is not an option, you should think about using composite models. So composite models should not be your default choice. Whenever you're using composite models, uh, you should set, this is a recommendation, of course, this is not something that you need to do uh, uh, this is not mandatory and it will not break your data model, but the recommendation is to set dimension table storage mode to dual. Uh, what does that mean? Dual storage mode means that uh, your table will be imported into the memory, but it will also, the copy of data will still be uh, available as a direct query data source. 
and that means at the query time, depending from uh, which your query, uh, from which main table your query target data, uh, data from dimension tables will be served either from import mode or from direct query storage mode to keep relationships in, uh, uh, to keep regular relationships. So the, the point and the idea of setting storage mode uh, uh, to dual for dimension tables is to avoid limited relationships. That's the main reason why we are setting this to dual. And of course, identifying appropriate refresh rate. As you may know, uh, when you're using import mode, you just keep the snapshot of your data uh, in Power BI in cache memory. So you need to refresh this snapshot from time to time. So it can it can uh, uh, happen that in uh, direct query big one uh, big uh, fact uh, uh, direct query table uh, you have the latest data and you haven't refreshed in the meantime aggregated uh, data in the import mode. So it may happen that there are some differences in uh, in results. Therefore, it's important to uh, identify the appropriate refresh rate for those tables that are in import storage mode. And because we are dealing with direct query scenarios, and those are usually very large fact tables containing hundreds of millions, sometimes billions of rows, uh, there is a great direct query guidance uh, on Microsoft's official documentation site. I will also drop the, the uh, link in the chat window. So whenever you are designing composite models, stick with those general recommendations that are relevant for direct query scenarios. That will also help uh, to improve the performance of composite models. And I already mentioned now, because those two are uh, usually go together, so composite models and aggregations. Uh, again, like with composite models, where I mentioned that we have two types for aggregations, there are also two types of aggregations in Power BI, user-defined and automatic aggregations. So user-defined aggregations, uh, that means, as their name suggests, you are in charge of defining and managing aggregations, even though Power BI will later automatically identify aggregated tables when executing the query. Uh, on the other hand, automatic aggregations is one of the newer features uh, in Power BI. I think maybe a year ago uh, was introduced. So uh, with th these automatic aggregations, you can yeah you can relax, sit, take a coffee, just toggle on this. Uh, option in your Power BI tenant and uh, in the background Power BI will run a series of uh, some apply some machine learning algorithms to identify uh, the most frequently run queries and it will automatically generate aggregated uh, tables in the background. So it's a kind of a black box. You don't need to bother yourself with that and that's also not part of the exam, but it's good to know just to be able to distinguish between these two. So what is the point of uh, having and creating aggregations in data model. Uh, first of all, reducing the amount of data. So if you have a huge fact table with, I don't know, three, four, five hundred million millions of rows, if you pre-aggregate data in advance, uh, you will probably reduce the number of, of rows and you will, uh, uh, in that way, you will uh, help the engine to scan uh, the lower amounts of data and it will, the results should be retrieved in, in most cases faster. One important thing to keep in mind, and that's I would say a key ingredient when we are working with aggregated tables, because I saw uh, not once in reality that uh, people create aggregated tables, they put them in the model, they create the relationships and everything, but then they forget or they don't know to configure aggregations in the Power BI itself. And I will switch over to my Power BI desktop to show you quickly a short demo how aggregations can help you uh, to speed up uh, performance and and uh, yeah improve the overall performance of the Power BI report. So this is my data model, super simple. I'm using Contoso uh, sample database. You can also uh, download it for free. So what I have here is this is my main fact table, online sales. It has around 12.6 million rows, so nothing special, but this is just for, for the demo purposes. And uh, this table is in direct query storage mode. How do, I, how do I know this? 
uh, this blue line on the top means that the table is in direct query storage mode. And also if you hover over it, uh, you will see that it says uh, that storage mode is direct query. I have three dimension tables, date, store and product. All of them are in dual storage mode. As I said previously, dimension tables should be set to dual storage mode whenever we are using composite models because of uh, re uh, uh, having regular relationships. Storage mode is dual, dashed line on the top confirms that. And I have three aggregated tables that I prepared in advance. So I have my data aggregated per date. That's the one, uh, one level of granularity. Then the second table aggregates data per date and product. And the third one aggregates data per date and store. So I have three aggregated tables. And as you see, I establish relationships, so everything looks good. If I go to my report here and let's turn on performance analyzer. Performance analyzer is a very handy built in feature in Power BI that uh, can help you understand your queries and what is going on behind the scenes once you start interacting with the report. So I'll click on refresh the, my visuals and let's wait for a few. Hopefully seconds, not minutes. Yeah, so you see that uh, my first visual that shows data aggregated on a year level. That's the one date sales. It took 1.3 seconds to render. From which around one second went on direct query. Then I have date product sales, which aggregates data on a year end brand level. And I have the last one which aggregates data on a year brand and store level. So I have three different grains here. And you see that the slowest one was this one with uh, the lowest level of granularity, which took more than six seconds to render. So what I can do now, I can go back to my uh, model view and let's configure aggregation. So I'll click on manage aggregations. I'll come back later to explain why this precedence property, this one is very important, but at, at this moment I will just configure aggregations, nothing else. So I want to run a sum, so that will be my aggregation of sales amount. And I want to take from my detail table is online sales table. So basically that's the table that, that Power BI will look to map the query to this table. And I want sales amount to be my detail column. OK. Apply all. Let's do the same thing for. Uh, our remaining two tables. So sales amount, sum, online sales and its sales amount. And here. Manage aggregations. Let's do again sum. From online sales and its sales amount apply all and go back to my report. Let's clear this and let's refresh our visuals again. You see now that those two date sales and date product sales were super fast instead of second and three seconds, they render in like uh, under quarter of a second. So if I uh, uh, expand now this, let me zoom it a little bit, there is no more direct query. Uh, if you notice, I didn't change anything in the visual. So the same measure uh, sum of sales amount, which is basically sales amount column from my original detail table that has 12.6 million rows, and there is no direct query. Let's copy this query so I can copy the query from Performance Analyzer, and I'll open it in Dex Studio. So I want to show you how you can check if the aggregation uh, work or not. So I'll turn on server timings, that's important. And then I'll paste my DAX query here in this main window. Let's run this query and let's go to server timings. This row here is important, which says match found. And if I click on this row on the right hand side, you will see that match was found and the query was mapped from my original table, which is online sales to my online sales aggregated per date because we are aggregating data in this visual per date. If I go back here and let's expand this one, 
copy query. I'll do the same thing. So uh, where is my DAX studio? Here it is. And let's just run this query now. You will see that again match was found. And in this case, Power BI is smart enough to remap the query to aggregated table that has the same level of granularity uh, that is uh, that is in our visual. So the, the important thing to keep in mind, because look at this. Remember, I, re I aggregated data per date, then per date end product, and then per date end store. So in this case, this visual here, let me clear this and let's refresh just this one. So this one can't be served from aggregated table, even though we have combinations. So we have date, uh, we have aggregated data per date. We have aggregated data per date and product and per date and store. But in order for Power BI to map the query to, uh, uh, to match the aggregation, the granularity between the visual and the aggregated table must be 100%. So it, it's not, uh, it's not, able to combine different granularities from your aggregated tables. In this case, we are still having direct query because the, the grain is not the same as in our aggregated tables. Now going back to explain this precedence property, let me open this here. And why is this important? Uh, when you have just one aggregated table, you don't need to care. It's, it will be always set to zero by default. But if you have multiple aggregated tables, especially with different levels, levels of granularities, it's very important to set this precedence property uh, uh, in a proper way. Why? Let me give you an example. Let's say that this table where we aggregate data per date, let's say that we have five years of data. So we have around 2000, 2000 records, like 2000 distinct dates and sales amount for each date. So we have 2000 records here. Then in another one where I uh, aggregate data per date and product, let's say that I have 50 different products uh, in my data set, 2000 dates multiplied by 50 products for each date, I can sell 50 products, that's 100,000 rows. Now imagine the third table that aggregates data per date, per product, and per store. So we had 100,000 rows from previous case, and let's say that our company has 50 stores. I'm using those uh, numbers just for the sake of easier calculation. Uh, so let's say that we have 50 stores, so on each date we could sell 50 products in each of 50 stores. So that's 100,000 multiplied by 50, that's 5 million rows. So what can happen if you leave this precedence property set to zero in all those tables? Power BI can arbitrarily choose which from which table to get the results. So in theory, if I go here, this one, this visual query query generated for this visual can be retrieved from any of those three tables, from those with 2,000 rows, but also from this one with 5 million rows. And I think we all know which should be more performant and more faster. Therefore, whenever you are dealing with multiple aggregated tables, make sure to set this precedence property and to set it in that way that uh, the table with lower number of rows gets higher precedence value. So the higher the precedence, uh, uh, Power BI will first try to use this table for aggregated, uh, aggregated queries. So this is how you should set up your uh, composite model when using aggregations. Original table, the big one, stays in direct query storage mode. That's a prerequisite for using aggregations. So you can't uh, set original table to import mode. Then there are no aggregations. Uh, dimension tables should be set to dual mode to avoid uh, limited relationships. And finally, aggregated tables should be in import mode. They can be also in direct query, but for the best possible performance, you should use import mode for aggregated tables. This one, I will not spend too much time. Dex variables and handling blanks. Uh, that's that's a topic also in uh, in uh, uh, in DP500 exam. For variables in Dex, I sincerely hope that you're using them. Uh, they have two main uh, 
uh, uh, advantages. So I always uh, encourage people to use variables in their DAX code. First, uh, it's code readability. It's much easier to debug and to read uh, code, not just that someone else wrote, but also your own code after a few months. Trust me. I know from uh, yeah, first hand experience and also performance improvement. Why? Uh, because variable, uh, this uh, expression that you use in variable will be evaluated just once and then engine can reuse this already calculated value in all subsequent runs. So code readability performance improvement. Always use variables in your DEX code. Blanks are also very important topic because uh, there are common requests from business side to replace blanks with some meaningful values. When I say meaningful, I mean meaningful for business. So let's say that you didn't have sales uh, for a specific date uh, for a specific product on a certain date. Instead of blank, they want to see zero. So what you can do, there are multiple ways to replace blanks in your reports. You can use if statement, check if the value is blank, then uh, with true false, just uh, uh, put whatever you want to, to display instead of blank. There is also more, in my opinion, more elegant way using coalesc function where first non-blank argument will be uh, will be uh, returned as a result. But I put here as a third uh, item, be careful. Uh, there is a thing in Power BI called sparse measures and uh, sparse measures. Uh, let's try to define them as simple as possible. So whenever uh, whenever you are you put, for example, let's see, let's imagine that we're using a table visual and you put a date and you put a product and sales amount. So whenever there is no uh, 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 there is no values for the certain combination of uh, dimension attributes, let's say today is uh, 28th of March and for 28th of March I didn't sell any product uh, with product uh, ID one. So the engine uh, has some internal optimization techniques to skip scanning of those combinations that don't exist. Uh, so it adds this non uh, this implicit uh, uh, non empty filter and it avoids scanning and it works faster. But if you explicitly replace blank with zero or with some other explicit value, uh, the engine will not be able to skip scanning those combination of rows and you will have cross join between dimension tables, which is not a big problem always. In certain cases, if you if you have very small dimensions or if you are just returning uh, value in the card visual or if your table has, uh, I don't know, 20, 30, 50 rows. But if you have a table or matrix visual or uh, uh, any other visual that contains a lot of a lot of records, a lot of values, this can really kill the performance. So be careful when you choose and when you decide or when you're being asked from business users to replace blanks with some explicit values. OK, so one of the things that Andy mentioned at the beginning was uh, this change that Microsoft implemented to uh, exam curriculum on uh, 6th of February this year. And one of the topics they added was query folding. Honestly, I was very surprised that this topic wasn't part of the original exam curriculum because in my opinion, that's one of the key features, key topics uh, in uh, when we are talking about performance in Power BI, especially because this is enterprise environments. We are talking about enterprise analytics. Uh, for huge data sets, whenever you need to refresh those huge data sets, query folding is very, very important feature, not just for refreshing huge data sets, but also for incremental refresh. If you don't have query folding in place, no incremental refresh is happening. That's another thing to consider. So I'm talking query folding, query folding, query folding. Maybe it's a good idea to explain what is a query folding in the first place. So whenever you perform uh, uh, trans data transformations on your uh, uh, on your data using Power Query. Uh, the the M code, so the M language that's being used by Power Query uh, uh, by Power Query engine, uh, for every single transformation step, 
there is an M statement uh, that's being generated in the background. Even if you're using just the user interface for that, in the background you will see a bunch of uh, M statements that are being uh, automatically created for you. So, uh, query folding is ability of Power Query's engine to translate M to the querying language of the data source. In most cases, we are talking about SQL, but also there are some other sources that are not relational databases that also support query folding. And in those cases, that those that this is the the this is a different language, not a SQL. Why is this important? Uh, well, the idea is to push heavy lifting on the data source. Why? Because relational database management systems. So we are talking about SQL Server, Oracle, MySQL, Postgre, and other other uh, relational database management systems. They are built to cope with huge amounts of data in the most efficient way. So if we are able to filter out our our data in advance before it. Uh, uh, comes to Power BI to Power Query, uh, then it's a significant win before we even started to perform our own transformations. So query folding is ability of Power Query engine to generate a single SQL query. That's important. Single SQL query that's going to be executed on the data source side. And I want to show you in uh, one example why should you care. First of all, data refresh will be more efficient than with direct query or dual storage mode. Your query must fold because in the end, uh, Power BI generates SQL queries that's going to be executed on your uh, uh, on your data source side. And for incremental refresh, as I already said, without query folding in place, there is no incremental refresh, so it will not be it will not break the incremental refresh process. But there is no benefit if you need to pull out all the data instead of just uh, taking the, the the most recent one that you define in incremental refresh window. One more important thing here to keep in mind: if your report is slow, or your visuals are rendering slow, or you have a large data model, so it's not because of query folding. So query folding doesn't have anything to do with that. And also to keep in mind, query folding is not all or nothing process. That means if you have uh, if you have transformations, let's say one, two, three, four, five, six, eight transformation steps, and your query folds up until fifth step after that is broken, so you can still you will still be able to take some advantage of the partial query folding, this part here. However, once you break it, all subsequent steps will not be pushed to, to a data source. Even though you are using transformations that should be fold, foldable, when you break the query folding, it's gone. OK, so let's do a quick demo for query folding. Uh, need not this one. OK, this one. So again, I have this online sales table from uh, Contoso database, and what I'm going to do is to uh, simply apply some transformation steps here. So for example, Let's say that uh, I want to pick from here. I will pick first name and last name and gender from my DIM customer table. Then let's make our first names all uppercase. OK, so they are now all, all uppercase. Let's apply some more things. So, for example, I want to keep only those rows where uh, where sales amount, where uh, total cost is greater than, let's say, five. OK, now I want to change the data type of my date, date key column from uh, date time to date. Then let's, for example, calculate, uh, yeah, something like absolute value of sales quantity. It doesn't matter. I want to show you just what happens when uh, query folding is working and versus not working. And finally, let's uh, let's replace, for example, uh, in our gender column, I'll go here and uh, replace. Not errors, sorry, I will replace F with female. 
Okay, and let's keep only those big orders. So where sales amount, where is sales amount? Here it is. So let's keep only those rows where sales amount is greater than 700, for example. Okay, so now if I right click on the last tab, you see this view native query option is enabled, so I can click on it. And that's the sign that this query can be pushed to a data source. So if I click off on view native query, here is my nice SQL query generated by Power Queries engine that will be pushed and executed on the data source side. Maybe it's not nice SQL, but it's correct SQL. So it will return results that I that I asked for. So you see, I converted my, I changed data type of my data column. I calculated absolute value of sales quantity. I did uppercase transformation for first name, replaced uh, F with female in my gender column. But the most important thing here is at the bottom. This one, so where clause, which will basically filter the data in advance. So instead of having, uh, oops, apologize, uh, instead of having 12.6 million rows, let's click close and apply and see what happens now. So Power BI will now load the data into the data model. So we have like, I don't know, uh, five seconds and 700, uh, 706,000 rows. What happens if I break the query folding? So I will now intentionally break the query folding. You shouldn't do that, of course. That's just for the demo purposes. So this step, when I change the type of my uh, date key column, I will delete this step, okay? And instead of this step, again, I will also want to keep only date portion. I'm not interested in uh, uh, hours and minutes, but instead of changing type, I will go to transform and date only. I know that this step will break the query folding, okay? So if I now right click here, you see view native query option is disabled, it's grayed out. In 99.99% .99 of cases, this means that query doesn't fold. And if I check here, this, this step is also not foldable. So I can check for this one. And the thing I was talking about, you know, uh, having partial query folding, now it's in place. So we have all the previous transformations pushed to, to SQL Server database, like changing uh, uppercase of our first name. But you can see that there is no where clause for sales amount greater than 700. So let's see what is the impact on performance here. So I'll hit close and apply. We know that we should have exactly the same number here. Yeah, so it's slightly slower, but in this case, still engine was faster, uh, fast enough uh, not to load the, old data, uh, the whole uh, data set before applying transformations. In many cases, when you break the query folding, what's, what can happen is that instead of pulling just seven, uh, 706,000 rows, uh, Power Query will pull the whole data set, basically 12.6 million rows, and then apply all the transformations over it. So query folding is super important feature in Power BI and always try to, to keep the query folding in place. There is a uh, like a motto that we share on Twitter and we are joking to don't break the fold. So keep this in mind. Uh, I think this is probably the last thing that we are going to cover from Power BI today and uh, it's related to direct query scenarios. Uh, in many cases, uh, I see people using direct query scenarios when it's not necessary. So what I suggest is really consider direct query as an exception rather than a rule. So always try to use import mode. Again, I mentioned this during the composite models uh, topic, but again, uh, try to use import mode whenever possible. Just when you are not in, uh, uh, in situation to use import mode, consider using other storage modes. And one of, uh, of those other storage modes is direct query. So try to use direct query to reduce the usage of direct query only to those three scenarios. First, your data is too large for import mode. If we are talking about uh, shared capacity, so pro license, it's one gigabyte per data set. With premium, 
uh, you can scale it with uh, enabling large data models up to 400 gigabytes. So I think you, you shouldn't run uh, in this kind of problems, except you are dealing with really, really, really huge amounts of data. Then real time reporting requirements. That's also valid reason for using direct query scenarios. So as I already mentioned, when you are using import mode, you are just taking the snapshot of the data in the certain time in the certain moment. And then you need to refresh to keep the data fresh in the report. You need to refresh this data set from time to time. That depends. So frequency depends on your needs. It can be every 30 minutes, once per hour, once per day, once per month and so on. So if you have a business requirement to have the data with maximum latency of, let's say, two minutes, then obviously you can't refresh data sets so, so frequently. But don't uh, fall into this trap so easily and talk to your users because whenever you ask them, uh, do they need, need real time data? They will always say, yes, of course, we need real time data. But try to explain them all the possible downsides, performance, uh, uh, possible performance degradation when using direct query. And from my experience, in most cases, they will admit that maybe they don't need real time data. And final reason uh, when security policies are defined uh, on the data source side, because report consumers credentials will be then propagated to this underlying data source and security rules will be applied there. So just use direct query scenarios just in those three cases. Andy, my friend, handing back over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right. Let's jump into it. So again, <clears throat> because of my intermittent network issues, if I get a bit crackly, uh, video goes a bit wonky, just tell me and I'll switch off. Switch off my video. Right, let's get into it. So as we said, an enterprise data analyst doesn't just deal with Power BI. They also deal with Synapse Analytics. Now, we only have to deal with two services in Synapse, the two SQL pools. It's all we have to concentrate on. We don't have to worry about anything else. No pipelines, no Spark clusters, nothing like that. SQL pools. So what we'll cover in here or in today, or dependent on you know, how much time we've got, we're going to look at uh, integrating Power BI workspaces with Synapse Studio. So there is functionality to bring a Power BI workspace in. We'll look at how to in integrate a workspace, a Synapse workspace into source control. There's only one source control provider, but there are two platforms that we can use. We'll look at that. That's a demo only, no slide. We'll look at dedicated and serverless those two services and the scenarios in which we're going to use it because that's what essentially the, the the exam will be testing you on uh, we'll look at querying data lakes in serverless sql pools and then because i did have i think about two questions related to complex data types in serverless sql pools which was surprising actually but we'll have a quick look at that as well so in terms of the workspace, what you can do is you can bring in multiple, so it's not just one now, it's multiple Power BI workspaces into a Synapse workspace and work with the Power BI artifacts there. It's limited, okay? So yes, you can bring in multiple workspaces by using linked services, so we'll see that. We can use either dedicated, or serverless databases to create a data set. However, we're not actually doing any form of clever web browsing or web authoring of a model. It basically downloads a, a PBIDs file. Yeah. So again, in the, in the uh, certification, you might get some questions around the different types of Power BI files. We've got a PBIX which is the model, the report, the data itself. We've got the PBIDs, which is a Power BI file that contains a connection to a data source. And we've got the PBITs, which is the template file. It's a little bit like a PBIX, except it doesn't contain 
any data. It's the data set definition and the report definition. But we can create and edit reports within um, the Synapse workspace once we've connected it in. OK, so just remember you can create and edit reports. But you still need desktop to be able to create a data set within a Synapse workspace. So this is how it looks. We can author a report. Uh, we can't edit the data sets. So once you've created the data set in Power BI Desktop and uploaded it, you're going to have to go open up Power BI Desktop, um, get that, or, or if you've got that desktop file stored locally or source controlled within uh, OneDrive or SharePoint, open that back up, modify, and publish back to the workspace without anything to do with Synapse. Okay, so you're not authoring the data sets within Synapse itself. So when we look at the two SQL pools, dedicated and serverless, look, what we're doing here is Microsoft really want you to stick to the use cases that they have defined for those two services. OK, so it's not about us coming to this and saying, oh, yeah, but you can use dedicated for this and you can maybe use dedicated for that. No, Microsoft are looking for the official ways in which you use these platforms. So on the dedicated side, OK, it is their large scale MPP, their massively parallel processing data warehouse service. You import data into its own structures. Yep. You don't have to worry about what those structures are. You don't have to worry about all the number of distributions that a dedicated SQL pool has. It's irrelevant for, uh, for, for, for this certification. However, you need to know that dedicated is for storing large amounts of data that can be retrieved very quickly. So we're talking terabytes of data stored within a dedicated SQL pool. We have this. I guess it's a feature of concurrency. OK, so when Nicola was talking about direct query and import, we have to be careful with dedicated SQL pools because it has this um, it has this uh, this workload concurrency uh, limitations. OK, so at each tier of a dedicated SQL pool service starts at DWU 100, scales up, you get a certain number of queries that can run concurrently. So, for example, if you've got a Power BI report that's in direct query and you've got a lot of visuals and you haven't set any throttling options within Power BI to, to limit the number of SQL queries it will send in parallel, dedicated could get flooded with requests. Another thing that crops up is that dedicated SQL pools supports functionality like data masking and column level encryption. That's something that serverless just doesn't have. It doesn't do. So if you see anything around data masking or column level encryption, that's going to be on the dedicated SQL pools side of things. On the serverless, I don't know whether it's going to get cut off there at the bottom there. Uh, there's no data in serverless. It all sits external. So serverless, it's almost like an API, a SQL API to talk to data that's in the data lake. The three scenarios, again, you know, Microsoft are looking for, your, for, for, for you to know that serverless SQL pools is used in three scenarios, either ad hoc analysis using SQL. Yep, so you're just using SQL to query data that's in the data lake. Logical data warehousing, so we're casting some structure using either external tables or views again over data that's in that data lake light touch data warehousing yeah so dedicated on one hand you can have all your flavors of uh, warehousing methodologies you've got all your flavors of um, how to track changes over time in your dimensions serverless on the other hand look it's it's not really for that but you can still cast structure over over um, data in the data lake. And lastly, data transformation. Yep. So if you've got data in a data lake, and again, you need some light touch transformation to bring it into a service like Power BI, it's useful for that too. So for example, 
Data flows. In Power BI, very useful to store data sets, or sorry, data flows within Power BI. However, all that heavy lifting can be done by serverless SQL pools if you've got a large amount of data in the data lake. In terms of serverless, it supports Azure storage or Azure blob storage, data lake Gen 1 and Gen 2, but really you want to be using Gen 2. And any question is going to refer to Gen 2, really. Uh, it does communicate with Cosmos DB and also the Dataverse. However, the Dataverse, it's literally syncing the data into the data lake. So there are the use cases there. Um, and then in terms of security, we've got managed identity, uh, service principle and user identity for serverless SQL pools. I didn't notice any security questions for serverless yet, but that's what we're looking for there. So in terms of data lake querying using serverless, <clears throat> ultimately, the things on the left are common to serverless SQL pools. So you can read data and you can write data. The only way you can write data is using the create external table as select. There's not many options yet. So if there's any questions around creating an external table um, you know, as a select statement, you've got no uh, nuances in terms of managing file names or partitions or anything like that. It's really very simple. Uh, we use the open row set command. Yep, so that is used to select data. If there's any partitioning questions in the exam, it's going to be around using the file path function. We'll have a look at that. And file name function is used, well, as it suggests, to return the name of the file. Uh, yeah, external tables and views are supported as schema objects within serverless. And you're being charged by the amount of data that you're processing. So not nothing about cluster size because you've got no control over any of that um, doesn't care how long the query runs for it's about how much data you're processing so if a query you're running processes a terabyte of data by aggregating it that's what you're going to get charged uh, and there's no configuration with serverless either so really as an upshot you've got serverless SQL pools that can read data in Azure storage Cosmos DB and the Dataverse and SQL clients will connect into, into serverless. So the complex data types, right? So I had to think about this and I really had questions that came up around a couple of functions that you use to query complex data types. And what I mean by that is uh, JSON documents, which can both be JSON files, but also JSON within Parquet, a column within Parquet files. So one of the questions I got was actually using these functions in a, a, a column which stored nested values, but in a Parquet column. I'll bring them both up actually. Um, oops, there we go. So in terms of JSON, there is no um, JSON uh, command, specific command within the open row set. It's just CSV. Again, I didn't have a question around this. There might be one in there that tries to trick you and says, yeah, do you specify JSON in the open row set command? No, it's just CSV. OK. And both Parquet and JSON support the JSON value and the JSON query. Now, I only had JSON value and JSON query, and that kind of makes sense because they do very different things. JSON value is all about extracting scalar values, just a single value from uh, a nested uh, array, whereas JSON query is all about breaking an array up into uh, the different values within it. That's how I remembered it. 
Yeah, JSON value is just scalar, but JSON query can deal with, you know, the array of data and display that. So I think we'll jump into, with the last 10 minutes, we'll jump into Synapse and just go through some of the things that we've gone through here, but in Synapse Studio. So the first one I want to look at is using Power BI within Synapse Studio. So I've already got a workspace set up within Power BI. So I've already gone and created that workspace and already put a, a, a couple of data sets and a couple of reports in. So the first thing we need to do is create a linked service. Yeah, so that's via an external connection, manage, linked service, we click new and usually you get this big thing that says Power BI. Yeah, but you can search for Power BI. And it's going to be that oh, HubSpot. Anyway, Power BI. And I'm going to say PBI uh, DP500 uh, development because that's the workspace that I want to attach into here. Uh, I've got my tenant. And my workspace name. I should be able to find my DP500 uh, development. Let me commit that. And again, I can add multiple workspaces. So it used to be constrained to just one workspace, but probably for the last year, maybe a little bit more, you can add multiple Power BI workspaces in there. So now we're in there. If we go into develop, I've got my Power BI objects down here. There's my workspace. You'd see multiple workspaces all listed down there. And I've got my existing data sets that I've created. And I can build reports from those within Synapse Studio. So I could go and I could click. Create a new report here. And then the data set opens up, build my visual, save it. And it will be available for me to view within Synapse Studio, but also in the Power BI workspace itself, because that's all it's doing is it's just communicating with the Power BI workspace. In terms of building. A data set. Yes, we do have the option to create a new Power BI data set. However, if we create that, we can select either a dedicated SQL pool or we can select a serverless SQL pool database. Uh, we can't select lake databases, which is good because it just keeps things nice and simple. Yeah, so there's all my server, there's all my serverless SQL pools databases, uh, and there's my dedicated there. So I'll download, I'll download it for dedicated, but as you can see, all it's doing is it's just downloading a definition file. So it's like a shortcut. So you download a PBIDs file, open that up, author my data set, save it, source control it in OneDrive or SharePoint, and then publish it to the workspace, and then it will just be visible in Synapse Studio. Right. But bear in mind, all it's doing is it's just communicating with the Synapse with the Power BI workspace. Close and refresh and my data set would appear here. So really, all you're doing is you're just creating a link service. You can create and edit existing reports. But when you create a data set, all you're doing is just creating uh, a connection, a PBIDs file, which then you download, you author in desktop and publish to the Power BI workspace. So in terms of dedicated versus serverless. So again, Microsoft are looking for. A separation of tasks for what those services do. So if I just expand SQL scripts and go to uh, DB 500 and go to dedicated SQL pools. Like I said, dedicated SQL pools, it's essentially a SQL database. 
data is imported into it, the way in which you distribute data within the, uh, the, the, the dedicated SQL pool is different. There's really only three ways of distributing data within a dedicated SQL pool. You don't have to worry too much about um, what it is. It's interesting if you like to read it up. It's not mandatory for the exam, but I can have a look and I can see that I've got tables, I've got dimension tables, and then I've just got the way that they're distributed, replicated, round robin, etc. However, the use case for dedicated is data warehousing, right? So I've got dimension tables, you know, I've got a date dimension, I've got a product dimension, whoops, so on and so forth, and then I've got fact tables. So for example, I've got a fact table here that's got 1.2 um, billion rows, and it's not the New York taxi data set, by the way, it's my own data set that I've generated. Um, but essentially, sorry, the wheel on my mouse is uh, playing up a little bit. Um, but essentially, fact table, yeah, star schema, all the things. We've got a fact table, we've got keys to dimension tables, but it's on a large scale, right? We've got billions and billions of rows, potentially hundreds of gig terabytes, you know, that's stored in the dedicated SQL pool. Um, and we've got queries that can aggregate that data. So let's just run a query there. And we've got some aggregate results. Yeah, so again, query folding in Power BI, you're looking to push down into dedicated to use, well, what dedicated is useful for, which is large scale data processing. So it's no good, Power BI only getting to a certain bit, breaking query folding when it still has lots of processing to do, because this is the engine that helps you do that faster. So that's dedicated. On the serverless side, it can actually look pretty similar because we can set up external tables, we can create views, but there's no data that's actually getting stored. The crux of serverless is how we deal with different file types. So in terms of setting up a serverless SQL pool, we can just issue a standard create database statement like we do. We can create schemas so we can we can logically um, separate our objects. Uh, don't worry too much about all the, the setting up of the security credentials. I never saw any of that in the certification. Ultimately, it's about connecting down into that data lake. So the file types that you can query with serverless are actually pretty limited. We've got CSV. So in my data lake, I've got some CSV files and the open row set command I can use to select that data. I can select the format and say CSV. I can select, really there's only two parser versions, one and two, I didn't see anything in the, certificate, in, in the exam about that. If there is, parser version two is faster, but it's got less features. I didn't see anything in the certification where it was asking you about the differences in the features, but parser version two is the fastest. And we can specify header rows and field terminators, uh, field, you know, a field terminator um, that's in the CSV. But ultimately, all that data sits external, and then we're just using serverless to read the data. We can extend it and add some schema information with the with command and specify some ordinal positions. So we can say in my CSV file, user ID is column one, event type is column two, so on and so forth. I can specify data types. Oops. And I can get the results back, but properly data typed. And if I've got multiple columns in the CSV that I don't, I don't need all of them, I can just select the ones that I want. It doesn't have anything to do with the data processed. It will still process the whole of the CSV. 
But we've got some metadata functions within serverless SQL pools. Um, file name and file path. Now, they are they're not exclusive to serverless SQL pools, but what we can do is we can get some metadata about the file itself that serverless is reading from, but also uh, partitioning by using the file path function. So in my data lake, I actually have a three folder structure set up. The parent folder is the year. Then I've got the month and I've got the date. And essentially these asterisks that you can see here basically relate to the file path function here. Yep. So number one is going to be the year. Number two is going to be the month. Number three is going to be the date. Yeah, so it's just referring to the level in the folder. Um, and then what I can do is if I run the select. I'm going to get back the contents of the CSV files, but I'm also going to get the metadata. So I've got the name of the file that this particular piece of data came from, but I've also got the values of those partition columns as well. You can use that in incremental refresh within Power BI, because if I cast event date to a, a date or a date time, I'm going to be able to set that up in Power BI as an incremental refresh column. So you can use it in both. You can use incremental refresh in both dedicated with a date time column, but also in serverless as well. So it's going to be around any questions that crop up around partitioning. It's going to be about the file path function. Um, so I'm aware that we are just over. Um, seven o'clock. Probably quite a lot there, so. We can carry on on Thursday, I think there's still there's still there's still, you know, quite a bit to go through. Um, hey, Andy, yeah. Well, yeah, there's a lot of detail in here, so I think it, it could be good to kind of carry this on in the probably in the third session. If you just want to maybe kind of give it a gentle little wrap up of where we are, so we've got a good place to move forward. From. Yeah, yeah. So in terms of what we'll finish off with in, on the synapse is just we're going to finish off the different file types that serverless um, can process. So that'd be Parquet uh, and Delta and, and a quick look at the JSON in terms of those uh, JSON value and JSON query functions, because again, uh, there's going to be there's probably be questions around, you know, what is the most efficient file type to use with serverless? And that is going to be if there's anything to do with Parquet or Delta in there, that's that's what it's going to be over something like CSV or JSON. So we'll finish off the file types for a few minutes um, and then we'll look at source control in the Synapse workspace and the visualization options within Synapse, both within Spark notebooks. I promise there's not much Spark and the SQL results pane itself. Uh, and then we'll look at purview. We'll look at the data governance. Cool. Sounds great, Andy. Uh, I see there was a question in there. Uh, I see Sanjay, you seem to have your hand up on there. Do you want to come in with a question? Yeah, can I ask you over here? Yep. Yeah, like uh, like for the query folding, like uh, we will be uh, doing it on certain columns, right? But first the loading of the data virus will happen. For that, we might have chosen certain columns uh, on which we have distributed, which, on which we might have distributed the data. But when it comes to the reporting, we might be using certain other columns for slicing and all. In that case, the query will again come back to the dedicated pool. Uh, in that case, like uh, how the dedicated pool uh, will be the performance of the dedicated pool because we would have distributed the data in a based on certain different column. 
Yeah, it's a good, good question. So luckily, you're not necessarily going to have to dive into too much detail in the certification around distributing the data in the dedicated SQL pool. But really, the question is around if you've got Power BI and it's set up to refresh from a table and you've set up incremental refresh on a specific column, that column might not be the way that the data is distributed in dedicated. So yes, you might introduce some inefficiencies if dedicated has to go to all of the different data distributions to collect all the data back that meets the criteria of the incremental refresh. So for example, incremental refresh is usually based on um, uh, time, right? It's usually it's usually based on dates and you know a, a date time. You know, only go and reload the last day in terms of the data. And one of the things in dedicated is it's not generally a good practice to distribute your data based on a date or time column because you might not get an even distribution of the data. But really, what you want to do is you want to distribute your data within dedicated as evenly as possible. You know, get all of those distributions and the compute from all those distributions working to your benefit. So if a Power BI query comes in and hits all those 60 distributions, it might be better for that the performance of that query rather than if it only hits like five of the distributions and has to try and gather all this data out uh, whilst only using you know a certain amount of compute. Um, but yeah, I certainly didn't see any questions within the certification that is around understanding how to distribute the data. Um, for anything like Power BI incremental refresh. But what we can do is on Thursday, we can just touch on dedicated uh, distribution for, for, for a couple of minutes. Yeah, we wouldn't we wouldn't need to go into anything too deep, but just so that just so that, you know, if everyone on here is, you know, if anyone's on here more on the Power BI side and doesn't really understand the concept of distribution, we'll just have a look at that as well for a couple of minutes. Perfect. Sounds good. Thank you very much. And uh, just flicking through, I think any other question that was popped in there has been handled, which is uh, inside in the chat, which is great. Um, it's great when there's two presenters because you just moderate yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that was very useful, guys. There's a lot to kind of go in there. I guess personally, I probably found the Power BI side of things a bit easier in there, obviously. Whereas on the Synapse side of things, then it's like, oh, okay, yeah, there's there's a lot in here. Um, so it's, it's it's there's there's a lot of content to cover. But uh, picking up on something you said earlier, Andy, I would agree with you that you don't really have to do these exams when you have experience. You can use them to learn things, and particularly Nicola, when you're going on about the composite models, because um, you know. I, I've been around the block a few times, all right? So I came across a use case the other day for saying, oh, this might be a composite model example. So I dived headfirst into it, all right? And <laughs> ran into all sorts of issues. <laughs> yes, know? yes. That, that, and it, that it, should be a la last island. <laughs> and it was a real, okay, okay, I need to learn more here, you know? So you, can, you, you know, just because you have the experience doesn't mean that you don't need to learn other things. And by doing these exams, sometimes you'll just pick up that bit of knowledge and go, oh, OK, now I know how to approach it. So um, I appreciated your couple of slides on those. So guys, we're going to leave it there. Thanks very much for your time. And we are going to see you again on Thursday. Um, have a great evening. Enjoy the rest of your evening, guys. And for everyone who attended, thanks a million for turning up. And we'll see you again on Thursday. All right. Thanks, thanks. Very much. See you again thanks, in a couple Andy. of days. Thank you, everyone. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you on Bye -bye. Thursday.